Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project conducted by the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., and locally administered by Brian Powers, who's our cameraman today, here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library. Today's date is the 26th of February, 2020, and we have the honor and privilege of interviewing World War II veteran and a Battle of Okinawa, Okinawa veteran, Earl Jr. Conklin. And Mr. Conklin, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir, and thank you for this interview. Thank you, sir. If you would, uh, tell us your date of birth and where you were born. 9621, St. Louis, Missouri. September the 6th. All right. Uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and what were your parents' names? My mother's name was Catherine, my father's name was Earl. And your mother's maiden name? Herb. H-E-R-B. E-R-B. E-R-B. -E and what'd your dad do for a living, Earl? He was a fireman on the railroad. I see. And then later on, uh, he had a heart attack and he, and when he went back after he got over his heart attack, he became an engineer, which was a lot easier. I see. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I had one brother. Uh, Cliff was my only brother, our sister. Okay, and uh, was your mother a uh, housewife or did she have an outside job or anything? No, she didn't work. I she see. She didn't work. Uh, no. And did you know either set of your grandparents? I never even saw my one set of grandparents, but the others were farmers. What were their names? In, right outside Columbia, Missouri. And their name was? Well, one was Jack Conklin, and one was Brown Conklin, and Brown Conklin was gassed in World War I, I remember that. That was an uncle? Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Did you know your other set of grandparents on your mother's side? No, uh -huh. never knew them. I see. And what, what schools did you go to, grade school? Well, I went to Woodward Grammar School, then I went to Cleveland High School, then I went to the University of Missouri. I see. In Columbia, Missouri. And what churches did you folks belong to? Well, when I lived in St. Louis, we weren't going to church very much. And, uh, but, but after I moved to Cincinnati and got married, I go to the Westwood United Methodist Church. I see. Um, now, you, uh, when you graduated from high school, uh, what uh, university or college did you go to? University of Missouri. And uh, you told me earlier that you were on a V-12 program? The V-12 program was a program that the service devised for people who signed up in the Marine Corps as private first classes, first class, with the intention of going to officer school at Quantico, Virginia. When they graduated from college, four years? No, what happened is I spent about six months after I signed up at Missouri, and then we were taken to Purdue University, and I spent about six months at Purdue University, and then we were sent to uh, Paris Island, which is boot camp for the Marine Corps, uh, right after I left Purdue. I see, so, uh, and were you in the Marine Corps as of that time? Well, while we were in, while we were in uh, school, 
We weren't in the Marine Corps. We were private first class, but that was only our rank. And then, and then as we moved along after we went to Purdue, we stayed there at Purdue. And then when we left Purdue, we went to Paris Island for three months, which was basic training. And after we left Paris Island, we went to um, New River. I guess that's South Carolina. I don't know whether it's South or North Carolina. And then we went to, um, to Quantico, Virginia, which was officer school. Up until that time, we were only private first classes. And what type of training did you have at these various stations you were at? Oh, in boot camp, it was just rifle training primarily. And uh, as we moved along to these different stations, it became a little more involved, like tactics and things like that, and command. But really, the real work was done at Quantico because they knew you were going to be dealing with troops. So it was a question of learning how to command troops and what to do and, and things like that. At this point in time, when you were at Quantico, how much college had you had un completed? Let me see. Oh, I had I had, had accomplished about three and a half years because after the war, I only had twelve hours to stay to take, and I went back to Missouri and took those hours and got my degree. Okay. Um, What made you want to be in the Marine Corps? What, what guided you to join the Marine Corps? Well, everybody was gung-ho after December 7th. And I just never thought about going to any other service in the Marine Corps. No, no specific reason. Mm -hmm. Speaking of uh, Pearl Harbor Day, December the 7th, 1941, how did you hear about that and where were you? I was living in a house with four other fellas and it came on the radio that night. I believe it was a Sunday night if I remember right. And you know, we just, we're all ears and, uh, and I had an eight o'clock class the next morning and that's all everybody talked about was the war. You were 20 years old at that time. Must have been about 20, yeah. Yes, yeah. And um, did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Uh, most of the folks that we uh, talk with, uh, we didn't have any idea where it was either. At, uh, was your family affected very much about uh, during the Depression as far as being out of work and having any hardships or any? Well, no, because my father being a fireman on the railroad, of course he used to, as a matter of fact, I can remember the number he used to call Garfield 6600 every day to see if he was going to work. But, well, come in at two o'clock in the afternoon or come in the night at five o'clock and, and you'll go to work. Garfield 6600 is the phone number. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's uh, it's amazing you remember that to this Isn't day. Isn't it though? Yeah. I swear. Well, I find out as you get old, you remember lots of things that you just have no idea that you would remember. Yeah. 
Did you play any sports when you were young and in college? Or in high it? school, I played um, basketball and baseball. In, high, in college, I played basket or uh, baseball for, I couldn't play as a freshman, so I only played two years. What position did you play? Third base. Third base. Mm -hmm. Did you play with anybody that went on to become famous playing baseball? Well, I did, but I wasn't famous. I, uh, I went on later, um, after I came back from the service, I think I got back in somewhere in March, and I went to spring training with the uh, Yankees, and I didn't sign with them. Uh, but I did sign with um, Brooklyn Dodgers there since they had been talking to me and when I was in college. I was a pretty good ball player. Yeah, I can say. Pretty yeah. good ball player. But after the war, I realized I hasn't touched the baseball in three years. And I was okay as a ball player. I hit 300 one year and 290 the next year. We had a good ball club and we had about five players on our team that went to the big leagues. And uh, so we won one year and we tied one the two, two years that I played. We won the league one year and tied one year. We had a good ball club. Real good ball club. What city were you playing out of? Are you, Danville, Indi Indiana. Danville, Indiana. Danville, Indiana. Not, nice town. Nice not town. too far from home. Oh, is that right? No, you're home. Oh, yes. Not too far. Yeah. No. Yeah. Did you stay in touch with any of the guys that you uh, played ball with? Yes. My roommate was a ball player who became very successful. He was a pitcher. His name was Carl Erskine. Sure. And he stayed with the Yankees, or the Brooklyn Dodgers, for 11 years. And he set some records, and he was very good. And we had some other, one kid went to the Chicago Cubs and we had one of them that went somewhere in a, uh, it's a short stop. We, um, we had a good ball club. Winning wasn't e was nothing's easy, but uh, you know, when you can win one and tie for the league in another year, you're doing very good. Yes. Well, then I decided I hadn't gone to college and I had a pretty good idea I wouldn't make the big leagues. So I went to work. I see. Well, let's go back, uh, if we can, to Quantico. And uh, Quantico is, a, 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 is like uh, a school to train you to, to be able to lead men and command men and yes. leadership talents and qualities. Yes. And they, they they worked on you. They would, uh, you'd get up in the morning and put on your fatigues and eat breakfast and, and, and then you'd go up and dress into your greens if we were going to have classwork or we, we'd have our fatigues on if we were going to use field work and, and they, then at lunchtime you had a change from one to the other, and then at night you change from one to the other before you ate. So they they tried to kind of wear you down. Although I don't know, I think there was only fellow, one fellow in my class that didn't make it because he talked in his sleep every single night. And you can't be in a Marine Corps online 
talking in your sleep. Very true. Um, according to your note here, uh, you graduated from uh, Quantico in April of 1944 and got your orders to Camp Pendleton? Yeah, we went home for a week on leave and then we all went to Camp Pendleton, California for another three months, but we screwed around more on not doing anything at Pendleton, just waiting to go overseas. That's all we were doing there. Were you a second lieutenant then? And then I was a second lieutenant. How did you get to Pendleton? Did you take a train or did they fly? I flew, I flew, yeah. I see. We yeah. flew. Just I just flew by myself. Um, now, did you have a, a, a girlfriend or a fiance or anything at this time? No, 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 nobody, no, nobody, no. So you're free, free most, and do what I want to do. It had to be somewhat exciting, maybe in California during those times. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we used to be entertained by movie stars while we were out there, and. Um, I'm drawing a blank on us in L.A., the special restaurant there we always... The Brown used. Derby? No. We never had a wait to get in, though. I remember that on, on Sunday. And uh, when we're at Pendleton or at Quantico, we would get off at Oh, five o'clock on Saturday and catch the train to Washington and we spent the weekend in Washington and I think there was about 10 women for every man in Washington at that time so that was not an issue and then when we got to California we we were entertained by movie stars in their homes and everything. The only one I can really remember was Hugh Herbert. He was such a funny guy. And, um, you know, when you traveled from California to the South Pacific, when you leave California, they have what they call land swells, where the waves go up like this, and then they don't tail off. They go up and drop straight down. And boy, was it rough. It was rough all the time in the Pacific. Um. So you stayed at uh, Camp Pendleton until December of 44, from April to December? Let me see, I gotta relate September. That sounds about right. If, if whatever I've got written. I'm reading your note here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, did Bob Hope or anybody come around there while you were at, uh, at, at Pendleton? Who? Bob Hope. No, yeah. no, I never did see Bob Hope. There, no. And what about Betty Grable or any of <laughs> No, unfortunately, no. Yeah. And, uh, of course, we left. You, it shows here you left in December of 44. Yes, that's right. And uh, on the, uh, the General Patrick? Yes. S.M. Patrick or something. M.M. M. Patrick. It was a, it was a, a. A.P.A. A.P.A. Yeah. Yes. I'm familiar with that somewhat. Uh, and um, I remember. I have a picture at home of. One of our rooms there with, a fellow made a drawing and there was nine of us at a table and. We were there at no particular purpose, but 
we were just there, and he drew drawings of us and things like that. You were en route to, uh, how do you pronounce this, Alan? Pavu? No, wait a minute. Let me, I have to rethink this. Um, when you left? Um, yes. Um, I always wanted to think of Palau, Palau but it wasn't Palau, it was uh, P A. Pavuvu. Huh? Pavuvu. 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 P A V U V U. Right, Pavuvu. And that's where we. That's where we joined the 1st Marine Division in Pavuvu. They had just come off of uh, Palau and they really got hurt on Palau because when they landed, it was a forced landing and those are, in the Pacific, those are very, very difficult, you know, because you're being fired on. Mm -hmm. and. Um, at Okinawa, we were, we were not fired on when, when we went into the beach. The Japanese decided that they would rather defend us about halfway down the island, because they, they knew they couldn't stop us because we were so forceful. Right. So, um While you were on Pabuvu, um, you're, you're preparing for the landing at Okinawa. Yes, we were and, preparing uh, to go to Okinawa at that time and... Uh, so, what did they do, take you over to Guadalcanal then, to train on Guadalcanal? They took us over to Guadalcanal to make forced landings, because landings are mass confusion. I mean, you just... Particularly, now if you land, when we landed on Okinawa, I was in the third wave, but we weren't fired upon when we went ashore, like they did at Pavubu, or Peleliu, rather, at Peleliu. Oh, yeah. And that's, in Europe, I guess that would be um, the big landing we made in Europe where they were, that was a fired on landing too. Makes a difference of day and night. Yeah, it's, um, I guess the Japanese, did, both on Iwo Jima and Okinawa, decided to let the Marines land. And they move. couldn't keep us, they couldn't hold us. Yeah. And, uh, um, so how, you uh, were training there for what, about 30 days? Yes. On, uh, on Ed Guadalcanal. And um, then we, um, we boarded ship. I don't know exactly what date, but I was on an LST and we had barges hanging on the side of the LST. And our way to Okinawa, the barges start to fall off because it was so rough, you, you, the whole trip, the bow would come up, when the bow went done, water would come over, the screws come out of the back, man, they'd shake the hell out of the, the ship. But um, we had to stop on our way to Okinawa at a little island called Ulithi because we were losing the the barges that we were afraid they were going to fall off and when you're in, on a convoy like that they don't stop for anything so from Ulithi to Okinawa we were our only escort was a PC patrol craft and uh, we were all pretty happy to get, as it turned out, to get to Okinawa with only a PC as a patrol craft to protect us. Mm -hmm. 
you um, you you um, arrived and you were on D Day, April the first, nineteen forty. April first. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you say you were on the the third wave. Third wave. What beach did you have? Uh, Blue Beach, which was at Kadena, yeah. at the Kukunina Air Force. Yeah. And I think they, I, I don't recall where they really started defending us, but that was about where we landed, I think was about halfway between the north and south ends of the island. See, Kod Okinawa is about 90 miles long. It was a big island. Right. We were on there for 82 days. But when we got ashore, on the fourth day, they decided they would send troops across the island to cut the south from the north. And so I was leading a patrol on April 4th and we encountered the enemy, and I was shot in my abdomen from one side to the other side. And it was, I didn't know what happened. Now all of a sudden I'm, I'm firing it. Actually, I think I killed the chap that day because I know he was laying against the tree, but I know I hit him. And uh, all of a sudden I find myself on the ground and then they bring up the, the stretchers and the jeeps and everything and take, they took me down to the beach. And that was kind of exciting also. We. We were put on a, a small boat because we were on stretchers and we went out to the ship in the bay. I would guess about a half a mile. And we got out there and we said, uh, we have some wounded people here. We want you to take them aboard. And the captain of the ship said, it's too rough, I can't take you aboard. Oh, it was rough as hell. And uh, we were getting beat up pretty bad. And I know I had a fellow laying on top of me. They stretched the stretchers across the bow or the sides of the ship and he was beating like hell. And so we went back to the beach and the doctor there said, what are you doing here? And we said, they won't take us aboard. Why won't they take you aboard? It's too rough. He says, let me go out with you. So he went out with us and he, we got out to the ship and he asked for the captain of the ship the captain of the ship says, it's too rough. And uh, this medical doctor said, well, I'll tell you, Captain, if any of these men die, I'm going to hold you personally responsible. Christ, I can hear him saying that today. All of a sudden, that old cherry picker arm came out, and, and by then, some way, they, they transferred to wire baskets for, for stretchers. You were just worn laying on a flat stretcher. You were on, laying in a, in a uh, wire basket about this, and just about that big. And then they took the cable and picked up the, the basket and took you aboard the ship. And, um, oh, so I told Terry this morning, I think I was operated on at two o'clock in the morning. What about the fellow that came out with you? Mm -hmm. Did he make it too? Yeah, yeah. 
But I can tell you one thing. If you've ever seen a man burnt from his feet to his head, he's a horrible looking man. He was on a, we used to have destroyers patrolling the sea for fear of the enemy. And he, he was on a destroyer. And at that time, we start getting these airplanes, kamikaze planes, whose sole purpose was to give up their life and dive straight on the ship. And he was, uh, he was up in the, in the quarters, and the plane just hit his quarters, and he's probably alive, probably alive. And, uh, but uh, when I left the hospital, they start taking those bandages off of him, and he was a real mess. Had a good spirit, though, I swear. He was burnt everywhere. Mm. So how long did you spend there on the ship? I don't know. However long it takes from going to Okinawa to Guam, because the ship was in Guam. I see. Or the uh, hospital the, the field was in Guam. The field hospital was in Guam? Yeah, yeah, the hospital was in Guam. And um, did, uh, how long were you there on Guam? I think I must have been there about a month. Yeah, about a month. And, oh, uh, I was nuts. When you were young, you couldn't get back to your men. I mean, you get me off the ship, send me back. Well, and then they finally decided, okay, we'll, we'll send you back. And I, I was pretty well healed by then. And uh, when I got back, quite frankly, everybody thought I'd been killed. But fortunately, I wasn't. And that day I got back, it was raining so goddamn hard. You, you couldn't hardly move around. And um, then it was just a matter of taking hill after hill, going south, and now you're, for the record, you're Company A yes. of the 7th Regiment of the 1st Division. Yes. The 1st Marine Corps Division. Yeah. Yes. And we were going south, and we got down around, I think Naha, as I remember, was pretty south, pretty far south. So we got all the way down there, and then there was a final ridge. The Japanese refused to surrender. And we got down on a ridge called Kanishi Ridge. And they were dug in the hills and they had burial vaults in Okinawa where they were dug into the hills. And we were in rice paddies, so you couldn't move. So what they decided, there were some roads going up the hills. So what they decided, Charlie Company from the second battalion moved at night, which is something the Marine Corps did not do on Okinawa, was move at night, because you get shot. You might get shot by friendly fire. So they got on Kanishi Ridge, 
but they had to be reinforced. So what they did was take all the men out of an M1 tank, just left two of them, a gunner and a driver, and they put six of us in the tank. And there was a road going up on the hill, so that's the way we got up on the hill to reinforce Charlie Company. And then it was, how do you reinforce somebody up there? Well, they had TBFs, were, which were torpedo planes, but instead of putting torpedoes in there, they put duffel bags full of food and ammunition. And they flew real low over the island, and they'd open those doors and boy those bags would come out you had to be a center fielder to keep from getting hit by one and uh, so we were there trying to move along the island and the Japanese just wouldn't give up and um, but finally they decided that uh, they were losing the battle, so they, uh, they finally gave up and we were relieved and the, the army came in and replaced us. And um, we, we moved up north on the island after the war was over. And we stayed there for a while and then in a, in their infinite wisdom, they decided to send our division to China. So we went to China and the, we didn't have any trouble in China though. The, the Chinese didn't want to screw around with us. But we did, um, we, I remember we spent Christmas in China one year and we had a huge party and there was two destroyers and a battleship in the harbor where so we invited a bunch of their officers into our Christmas party. And boy, our colonel got so snockered, he didn't know what he was doing. And uh, we stayed in China, I think, about three months. And uh, we, we, didn't, we didn't do anything. Oh, there were a few Chinese or Japanese still there, but they didn't bother us. And um, we, I remember we used to go up to the Great Wall and just to see what it looked like. And, um, but we, we didn't do any fighting in China, as I recall, except that we, when we were in China, we used to live in homes in China for fear that the families would be, a, any Japanese might attack them in the home. And I'm trying to think of what we did all that. It was winter there, I remember that. But uh, we had that huge Christmas party. And finally it came that we would be replaced in China. And we flew back, or went on a ship back to San Diego and um, that we were given one week leave when we got to San Diego. So at that time I was living in St. Louis. I went to St. Louis and spent a week and then I went back to Chicago at the Great Lakes Naval Station to be discharged. And uh, I remember one night we went to the 
Chicago Blackhawk Hotel for dinner, and we had this lieutenant who was killed, his wife there for dinner, because she obviously had a lot of questions. But uh, that was, and then after the, the war, I went back to Missouri for 12 hours, got my degree. I graduated, I think, in February, and I went to spring training in March, and I stayed there down south, either with Brooklyn's, the Brooklyn team or, or the New York Yankees team, and some of the players who were on the Yankees team Jerry Coleman, and he was working out of third base against me. Of course, he became a great Yankee ball player, and Ralph Hauk became a manager. And But that's kind of my story in the uh, Marine Corps. Um, going back to uh, the, that ridge that you were on. Kanishi Ridge. Kanishi Ridge. Um, how long were you up there on that ridge? Eight days. Eight days? Eight days. It took us eight days. And I'd like to make a couple of comments. Everybody thinks that cooks have it easy in the service. In combat, they become stretcher bearers. And I can remember one afternoon on Kanishi Ridge, we lost three cooks on a stretcher trying to bring a wounded fellow back. The Marine Corps was fanatic about not letting the Japanese get a hold of any of our wounded. They were absolutely fanatic because they knew what, what might happen. And uh, that's sort of the end of my story, but what people don't real, have no reason to realize because they see the movies and at night people were moving all over the damn place. We didn't move at night for fear we would be shot. And um, war is hell. Mm -hmm. Nothing glamorous about war. I know I saw Two of my corporals that I had went through boot camp together all through all of the service and were together in my company and got killed on Okinawa. We had heavy, we had heavy casualties. We had heavy casualties. That you see, you see, you're always on the offense. And they're on the defense waiting for you. Right. And they're, like on Kanishi Ridge, they're, they're dug in caves and burial vaults. Burial vault was a thing like this. On the concrete front where they put their, it was a burial vault, but they used to put their soldiers in there, see? Yeah. And that's kind of tough to get at them. And a lot, Kanishi was hilly. It was very hilly, and um, we were, I wasn't, but the first division was on Okinawa for 82 days. Now, the normal operation for an island, oh, I, well, uh, Guadalcanal was longer. Guadalcanal was much longer. That was a defensive battle. That was not an offensive battle, because our purpose there was to maintain Henderson Field, the airfield there. So we had a, pla a place to land our planes when they were coming back from uh, their uh, fighting runs. And, well, I 
I can remember when we were training on Okinawa, just before we took off. And we were using live fire in our training. And we had a bazooka, which of course was a long tube and shot a shell out of there. And I was on the hill, and I don't know, I had a feeling. And I ran down the hill, and on the bazooka, they laid a tube on his shoulder, and a fella in the back lights the switch for the shell to go out. And I went down there, and I said, be sure the tube is clear. Well, something happened as it blew up. And I'm telling you, those kids, they were just blown to pieces, mm. absolutely blown to pieces. But that's part of war. Um, I was fortunate enough after the war to go to, what was the be big beach in Europe? Uh, Normandy. I went to Normandy and I made up my mind that I wanted to see what Normandy looked like. So we parked a car on the beach and we start walking up the hill. And man, they had these 105s dug in that you couldn't get at them. Normandy was just terrible. Mm. The difference between the Pacific and Europe was the difference in distance. We were taking hills. They were just, in Europe, they were taking cities. Right. It was totally different. And, uh, and countries. And it, obviously, one was as bad as the other. But, um, well, I was very fortunate to come out alive, and um, here I am today, recording. The, um, those TBFs, those torpedo bombers, uh, they weren't dropping torpedoes, but they were dropping you food and ammunition along that ridge? The bags, the big duffel bags the round duffel bags, right. and they were filled with ammunition, and ammunition was carried in a metal box about this wide, long, about this high, and about this wide. And those metal boxes were flying through the air all over the place. And kids were getting hit by them, too, and, uh, and food, because that's the only way they could get the food up because the only way we got up on the hill was to go up in a tank. Yes. I, um, my, my platoon sergeant had gone through Peleliu and he was at the end of Okinawa. And he just went blue. He just couldn't handle any more death. So we had to put him in a tank and get him down off the hill. Now on an M1 tank, you can either enter it from the top or you can enter it from the bottom. There's a hole in the bottom, you can go up. Well, Jim was six foot three. Boy, did we have a hell of a time getting him in that tank. Because he stiffened up on us. But we finally got him in and he, he took treatment after the war. And what was Jim's last name? Pardon? What was his last name? 
James Moll, M-O-L-L. Fantastic. Everything I learned about combat, I learned from Jim. Oh, another story that used to go around in the service. Enlisted men didn't like officers. I can tell you from experience, the enlisted men didn't move until the officers did. Officers had to lead, not push. Mm -hmm. And Marines were very strong and on Okinawa, I think an army division lost their colors because they couldn't move the Japanese. It's, you know, it's, you know when you're being fired upon, it's pretty tough to move. Mm -hmm. It's pretty tough to get your move, your men to lead you too. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it's this, the old story, once a Marine, always a Marine. If you see a Marine today, he'll say that to you probably. You're a Marine, once a Marine, always a Marine. Yes, you do. Um, <clears throat> did you have, did you use flamethrowers while you were there? Flamethrowers? Yes, we did. We used to have to use them in those, um, um, the vaults? The vaults. And we used them on the vaults when you got action there. And you have to use them in the cave. They had tunnels all over the place. They'd move from here over there and over here. And those kids had to go in and get them. Oh, really? And um, when you go to war and you come back alive, if you're in combat, I'd say you were pretty lucky. Do you, uh, did you stay in touch with any of the guys in your outfit after the war? I had a corporal in Louisville when I lived in Cincinnati, and we used to see one another. But after the war, we, Able Company, used to meet in a different city for about 12 years after the war. And the story would always, we'd always meet in the big hotel. And the story always used to go, that sounds different than we said about it last year. <laughs> you know, their memories were already fading. Mm -hmm. And it was, yeah, we, we, we got together for 12 years and then it got where so many people couldn't travel anymore that uh, we had to stop going to um, the various cities. What was, uh, who were your commanding officers in the Able Company? Well, that's interesting. In the company that I was in, Our company commander was killed. Our executive officer disappeared. We never did find him. First platoon leader was killed. I was wounded. Third platoon leader was killed. Machine gun officer, he was not wounded, but he ended up with the Silver Star and um, the mortar officer was not killed. So four out of seven were killed. Mm. The fellow, that, the officer that ended with the Silver Star, what was his name? Do you with the what? The, the, the officer who was awarded the Silver Star, what was his name? Don Farquhar. Farquhar? Farquhar, F-A-R-Q-A-H-A-R. Marvelous officer. Oh, was he good. The, uh, the night the company commander, while I was away, the company commander was killed. It was written on a map 
and he took one in the head. And then my friend Don took over the company and uh, he got the Silver Star for that. I see. And, um, we hear a lot about the different uh, kamikaze pilots and things like that over there on Okinawa, all the destruction they caused. Could you see out into the ocean while you're there on Kanishi? I never Ridge? saw a kamikaze hit a plane, uh, but I saw the results of a plane hit by a kamikaze. They just explode, you know. They just drive straight onto the deck and phew, there's all that gas and oil in there right. blowing up everything. Yeah. That was, they called that the picket line. For the for the destroyers. Um, this is jumping ahead a little bit. Um, where were you at when uh, the first atomic bomb was dropped on August 6, 1945? I was in. Seems to me I was in North Korea then, uh, not North Korea. China. Uh, Iwo Jima then, when the bomb was dropped in Europe, I mean on uh, uh, Japan. Um, I don't show you being on Iwo Jima on your uh, biography here. I don't show you being on Iwo Jima. Oh, I wasn't. I got yeah. mixed up. I'm sorry. Yeah. I got mixed up. When you said that, yes. I meant Okinawa, right. not Iwo Jima. Yeah. No, that was another ball game. Yeah, um, so you were, uh, did, uh, the news that you received, what was the news that you received? You know, because nobody had ever heard of this bomb before on August 6th. When August the bomb 9th. dropped? August 6th, 1945. Well, I must have been on Okinawa. Ok I was on Okinawa then. Right. I wasn't up on the north end of the island before we went to China. And um, where were you at when you heard that the Japanese had surrendered? You. Uh, when the Japanese. You, you uh, departed Okinawa in September on the Saratoga. I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember. I really yeah. don't. I might be mixed up when the bomb was dropped and yeah. when, when, when um, the armistice was signed or whatever they called September, it. September, yeah. I'm, I, I'm not sure on those dates at all. That's all right. Uh, they might be in there, I don't know. But my memory right now is holding up pretty good. Yes, it is, excellent. Uh, at, um, after you were discharged there at Great Lakes, uh, you went back to St. Louis and or you went back and got your 12 hours, uh, credit hours from the- uh, yeah, Then I went to work. And where did you go to work? Travelers Insurance Company. And I only stayed there a while. And then I went to American Automobile Insurance Company. And then after that, I was a specialist. I was a bond man. I used to write bonds for contractors on public work they did. Mm -hmm. And we were a relatively small company because we, all our offices weren't with bondmen. And I remember I went to three different comp cities when their bondman went on vacation. So I would go over there and the, the bond man, or the manager of the Cincinnati office took a liking to me and he didn't like his bond man, so we just switched jobs. I was working in the home office then, 
and he took my job in the home office, and I took his job in Cincinnati. And the name of that company again? His name was Bob Plettner. No. He was a nice guy. He really was, but uh, he and the manager didn't get along. Uh, our manager was a retired colonel, and Bob Plettner used to wear his, his pinks to work all the time, and he didn't like that. And uh, w the name of the company, again, that you worked for? the insurance. American Automobile and Church Company. I see. And, yes. And uh, did you stay with them long? Oh, that's where I retired. I retired when I was 72. So you stayed with them? Yes. Uh, I love them. Through the, uh, through the math for me, how long were you with that company? Terry, how long were you? Oh yeah, I, after, that's right. After I left the company, I went in the agency business. That's right. I left the. I didn't work for American that long, and then I was in the agency business for a long time, and I finally retired when I was seventy-two. And what was the agency? O'Leary, did you say? It was Thomas E. Wood Agency. Oh, Thomas Wood Agency. Yeah. Yes, they were a big agency. Oh yeah. And they wanted me because I was a bond man, and we were kind of scarce. <laughs> I had my own business, but I also was paid to run their bond department. I see. It was nice. Well, somewhere along the line, you got, you got married. Tell us about <laughs> how you uh, got acquainted with your- The future. second year I came back, From playing ball, the pitcher on our team came back with me. And my mother used to say, oh, you have to go out with the Vaughn girl. She's a nice girl. She's an RN. I said, okay, Mom. So I went out with her. What was her name? Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-A-N. And I, um, we closed the bar about 2.30 one night and I took her home. And I said, could I see you the next night? She said, yeah, she was getting off duty as a nurse, and on the second night, I asked her to marry me. Now, she knew me in high school, but I didn't know her. I was, I was a senior when she was a freshman or a sophomore. And you know, having been a ball player and basketball player, you're, you're a BMOC. And um, and then we we ended up big being, man on campus. I haven't heard that in a long time, but that's very good. Though keep going, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, we uh, we were married for sixty five years. What was her full name? Jeanette Ann Conklin. Uh, but her maiden name, Jeanette. Uh, and Vaughn? Oh, oh, she was Vaughn. Vaughn, Vaughn, V-A-U-G-H-A-N. Uh -huh. And why we, I, when I tell people that story, they can't believe it. 65 years later, well, at the end, my wife got Alzheimer's and she was in a home for about six years. And then she just, family died. Earl, um, what were her parents' names? Oscar. Oscar. Roscoe, Oscar. And her mother's name was Tilly. Tilly was her mother's name. And Roscoe Oscar was her father's name. And he worked for Westinghouse 
ele elevator division, I remember. He was a real pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, did you, uh, how many children did you and uh, Jeanette, is that correct? Jeanette, we had three children. Terry is my one son. Uh, he's my middle son. My oldest son died two years ago. He was 65. And my daughter lives in Cleveland, and she must be about 62. You're I know you were all two years apart. And your oldest son, what was his name? Scott. Scott, and your daughter's name? Kim. And uh, did Scott have any children? Four or five. Four. Four. So you have four grandchildren. Uh, do they live in the area? Or? They live in, in uh, Cincinnati, I yes. As, far as, as a matter of fact, we're supposed to see my one grandson this week sometime. I see. I'd take him to dinner. And uh, Terry have any children? Oh, yeah. Terry has three. And he's just lucky as hell. His son is a psychiatrist, and he lives in Nashville, Tennessee. And he just got a new job. Terry lives about four hours from Denver at, the, at a ski lodge. And tough life. Tough living, and he can ski. And his one son in Nashville just told Terry that he was being moved to another town up the road, maybe, how far, Terry? 10 miles. 10 miles. So he's going to have all three of his children right out there with him. Oh, Isn't that wonderful? Yes. And your daughter? She lives in Cleveland. And does she have any children? She has one son who's getting his bastard, master's right now, and he looks like he's going to do his internship with IBM. And my daughter works for a company called Well, you have granddaughter. Granddaughter works for. Uh, who does she work for? Well, you have Ro a Roosevelt Institute. Roosevelt it's a, Institute. It's a very liberal company. I don't know too much about it, but uh, she seems to be happy. Neither one of them are married. My son is twenty-six, and my daughter's. Granddaughter and grandson, Grand, yeah. 26 and 22. So you have, I count, eight grandchildren, or is it nine? No, we got nine. Nine. Yeah, we yeah. got nine. Yeah, nine. Well, that's a very, uh, you follow the biblical words, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. <laughs> yeah, And if, you're right. And uh, of course, all that's changing now, though. Yeah. Kids, kids don't want to get married young now. We, uh, they wait. And they can do everything single they can when they're married. And uh, it's, yeah. it's just part of life right now. But I, uh, we've, we've, uh, we're rounding down here. We've got about 15 minutes left. And uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, we ask all of our World War II veterans your feelings about us dropping the two atomic bombs on Japan to end the war. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Absolutely. And I'll also say anybody who was in combat, I mean in combat, not as a clerk or something, would agree with me. Yeah, I think uh, anybody that was in the service when you were in 
regardless of their position, agree with you 100 percent. Yeah. Um, and um, Brian, I want to give you an opportunity because I know you have some questions. Uh, just a couple of questions. I know we, we don't have a lot of time, but I was I was curious. Maybe you mentioned it. I might have missed it. But why why the Marines? Don't have the slightest idea, except we were so goddamn gung ho. We had no idea what we were getting into. I remember, as I mentioned before, I, I had an econ class the next day, and I, there was a football player sitting next to me in class, and I said, John, you don't have to worry, we'll never go overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Little did I know. <laughs> Oh, there's a difference between the Marine Corps and the Army. There is. Marine Corps, you know, you never say, oh, I was a Marine. When people ask me what service were you in, I'm a Marine. It's not I was in the Marine Corps. I'm a Marine. And it's just, the spirit of corps in the Marine Corps is great. It really is. And it's, and any, you know, the Army, they, they, were, they had tough times too. And, uh, but um, I will always remember when we were on Guadalcanal training, They used to have a grass out there they called kunai grass. It was about seven feet tall. And you'd be walking through that, and it was like walking through a powder plant or something. It was so dry, you could hardly breathe. And uh, I, think, I personally think the uh, Japanese screwed up. They were getting ready to move 10,000 troops to Guadalcanal early. I'm not sure we could have handled 10,000 Japanese troops. I think they made a mistake. I think they could have taken the island because we didn't have that many people there. That's right. You mentioned you were in the third wave. I was, I was wondering what, what, what did you have like as far as weapons? What, yeah, what, what were some of the things you had on your purses? Well, first of all, I had, a, I had a pack on. And when I was aboard ship, there was a skipper who got to like me, and he called me in one day, and he says, Earl, I want to give you our gangway 45. Everybody wanted a 45 pistol. But when you hit somebody with that, you know they were going down. We were carrying a carbine, a little miniature M1. She had, you could hit somebody and it wouldn't even knock them down. So we, we, I was really happy to get that. But that's the only weapon I have. I stopped carrying the uh, carbine. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I carried that, yeah. Because that's what I was firing when I, the Jap was firing at me and I was firing at him. I remember that now, yes. Was it difficult to keep that, your weapons clean when you were out on the island? No, but we had one rifle. It was called... Can't think of what it was called. Terrible weapon, malfunctioned constantly. Was that a Lewis machine gun? No, it was a it was a rifle. I just can't think of it. I'll think of it in a minute. Terrible weapon. Terrible. The weapon everybody wanted was the Thompson submachine gun. Boy, they rattle off those bullets out of that thing like crazy. I th I, I think they're. They, they handled a 20 clip, 20 shell clip. And uh, 
You're not thinking of the M1 Garand, were you? No, the Garand was a great weapon. Right. That held six shells in a clip. That was a great weapon. And prior, early in the war, though, during Guadalcanal, they were still using the M1. Not the M1, um, the, um, they were the using bolt action. The 1903. Yeah. Um, yeah, 1903. Right, Springfield, 1903. Right. No. It, um, I don't know if anything else I can tell you from my experience, but I'll tell you, it's hell. It really is. You know, you're laying in a hole all night. When you're when you're online, you're laying in a hole with somebody. And I had one of my people that they got up close enough that they threw a grenade in the hole and blew his leg off. And you don't move. You don't move. And uh, the war and the Pacific was totally different than the war in the Pacific, really was. And I'm not saying that it was more difficult in the Pacific than in, the, than in Europe or any of that. I'm just telling you it was more one-on-one -on -one in the Pacific. How do you get out of this outfit? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, uh, we, we talked to guys who were on some of those islands and they ran into like a lot of like bad weather, like uh, hurricanes and things like that. Or did you ever have a tsunami or something while you were out? And they, when you were in... Tsunami? We had a lot of rain. We had a lot of rain in Okinawa. I can tell you that. But Okin you see, Okinawa is... 90 miles long and 10 miles wide. That's a big area. And uh, when they divided it, uh, we had a general killed on Okinawa. Buckner. Simon Boulevard Buckner, yeah. Buckner was killed, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. One thing I would like to I mean, they, they stayed in touch. Bob Leonard. Every year. Every yeah. year. Bob Leonard. He so had the says Christmas cards and they call and they talk. It's, it's absolutely amazing how that network survived so long. Yeah. And it was so reliable. I mean, every year it was. Well, he's 90. He's 93. And, uh, so he was a little younger than I am. And, uh, but every year they would go to, go to Marine Head Headquarters in North Carolina and then meet, and this was in the last 20 years, every year, until it got, what, five? There were like five people left that had died, and then they just decided to have You know, they're just... How just old are like, you now, uh, Earl? 98. 98. I'll be... September the 6th, you'll be 99? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been lucky. Yeah, you, uh, remarkably so. You look wonderful. And uh, you have your uh, mental faculties complete. And yep. uh, it's... Uh, well, the last week I've had a little battle with something. I don't know what the hell I battled, but I... I I told Terry, I dream so much I can't distinguish between reality and real life. You know, it's funny that 
maybe one of the last questions is, um, a lot of the guys that, we, that I talk to and are associated with, I ask them, uh, how often do you think of the war? And some of them tell me that something happens every day to make them. Well, I guess I think about the war every day. Yeah, something that might have happened and, uh, and uh, you know, well, it's over, it's yeah. over. Yeah. The war's over. Now we got other wars. And, uh, but some of those poor veterans, yeah. you know, when you get your both legs shot off or you, an arm and two legs and, Terrible. As I said, war is not fun. Yeah. Uh, Brian. Well, sir, we've um, we've reached the uh, time oh, allotted for well, us. That went fast, right? Yeah. Thank I you. I want to thank you for this interview. Thank you. I want to thank you for being a great American and thank a patriotic American thank and you. your service to our country. Thank you so Drives much. Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs>